the Middle East, a region scarred by conflicts, wars, and implacable hatred, constantly stoked by the political interests of global powers. I think that in recent decades, we've been trying to solve problems that we ourselves created, namely in 1918, 1919. The First World War, the original catastrophe of the 20th century, not only for Europe, but above all for the Middle East. Carried by the hope of independence, Arab tribes rebel against the Ottoman Empire. As a quid pro quo, the Allies have promised them their own kingdom. But at the big peace conference, they draw borders with ruler and pencil that continue to have an effect today. In the Paris suburb of Sèvres, the fate of a whole region is sealed. In the Middle East, it's obvious that the arbitrary dividing up of the former Ottoman Empire will be the stuff of enormous conflict. Thus, IS propaganda makes capital out of a secret agreement of the time, called Sykes-Picot. As you can see, this is the so-called border of Sykes-Picot. Alhamdulillah, we don't recognize it and we will never recognize it. Even today, in the Arab world, the expression sykes Pico stands for the infamous interest-based politics of Western states. It's a useful shorthand, and it expresses the frustration and fury of the Arabs and the other peoples in the Middle East that nobody consulted them when those borders were drawn. For 10 years, the German historian Robert Gerwart has studied the after-effects of the post-war period. The breakup of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War is deeply entrenched in the public consciousness everywhere in the Muslim world. In Turkey, too, the Sevres Agreement, which sealed the breakup, still plays a decisive part in society and politics. If this putsch had been successful, they would have forced something on us that would have made us long for Sevres. In the Middle East, where the end of the First World War is associated with further humiliation, the significance of this period cannot be underestimated. I think it's important to understand that in order to better analyze conflicts in the region today. Paris in January 1919. In the months to come, the metropolis on the Seine is at the center of global politics. In the French capital and its suburbs, the victorious powers want to create a new world order. The Great War plunged not only Europe into chaos, but raged in many other regions too. Thus, delegations have assembled from faraway countries. They're looking for recognition, independence, and freedom. It was one of the biggest international meetings of the 20th century and, in, and indeed of the 19th century. And what was interesting about the Paris Peace Conference, among much else, was that it was truly a global conference. There were countries from the Americas, there were countries from Asia, Japan was there, Thailand was there. It was dealing with the Middle East, it was dealing with colonies in Africa and Asia, and its impact was felt around the world. In Versailles in 1919, Germany signs what must be the most notorious agreement of the 20th century. The peace accord puts everything else that is negotiated in the following months in Paris in the shade. You have to put Versailles to one side and then look at the other agreements to see how it is in Europe as a whole. And when we talk about Europe, then this includes the whole Middle East. The region was completely redesigned by these treaties, sometimes for the good, but often enough for the bad. The Versailles Peace Treaty is only one of five that are signed in Paris. All the defeated states that fought alongside Germany have to submit to the will of the Allies. From the point of view of the victors, the defeated Central Powers are responsible for the catastrophe that brought starvation, death and suffering to Europe and the world. And now they should atone for it. First and foremost, the Ottoman Empire. 
In 1918, Turkey and Germany are two of the defeated states of the First World War. The various treaties that were drawn up in Paris were signed in the suburbs of Paris, and the treaty signed with the Ottoman Empire was signed in Sevres, which is where, of course, the famous Sevres porcelain is made. In 1920, in this porcelain factory in the Paris suburb of Sevres, the course is set for the future of a huge swathe of the world. The Ottoman Empire signs an agreement under protest that seals its fate, the effects of which are still felt today. And it was actually signed in the showroom of the Sevres porcelain factory, which I've always thought is appropriate because that porcelain is very beautiful, it's very fine, but it is quite fragile. And if you drop it on the floor, it'll smash into a lot of pieces. And that's essentially what was happening in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire ruled for hundreds of years over huge parts of Europe and North Africa. But by the 19th century, the empire had lost many of its territories on the European continent. Following Bulgaria's independence in 1908, the Ottomans lose the last parts of their empire in southern Europe in the Balkan Wars. The tottering empire is governed from Constantinople, today Istanbul. On the Bosphorus, Sultan Mehmed V and his multi-ethnic state face threats from both inside and out. In the past, it was only with difficulty that the ruler had managed to keep the differing ethnic groups peaceful and hold his empire together. One important prop in this was the military. The Middle East before the First World War was in turmoil, and there were many conflicts between individual ethnic groups and minorities. But it's not the case that the Ottoman Empire, which at that time was in control of this part of the world, was already doomed to fail. Since the beginning of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire has been seen by many Christian nations as the sick man of the Bosphorus and an empire where one can practically help oneself. With the outbreak of the First World War, the political agenda shifts once and for all. But the battles on the Western and Eastern fronts are only one part of this bloody conflict. In August 1914, the Empire of Mehmed V joins the war on the side of the Central Powers. For the fragile empire, the alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary is both a risk and an opportunity. With the support of Germany, it is intended to modernize the badly equipped military in the hope that victory will result in a newly strengthened Ottoman rule. The Sultan's troops are mainly occupied fighting soldiers from all over the British Empire, which is also pushing for influence in the Middle East. To weaken the enemy from the inside, since 1915, British diplomats have been seeking coalition partners in the region. The holy city of Mecca, then under Ottoman rule, is governed by Sharif Hussein bin Ali, a man with great ambitions for himself and his powerful family. His son Faisal is an emerging political talent. Faisal's family was a family of Ottoman officials who had even served in the Ottoman parliament. This means that they had long identified with the Ottoman Empire and were part of the system. The British wanted to get the family of the Sharif of Mecca and their son Faisal on board in their plan for an Arab uprising which would ambush the Ottoman Empire from the rear. The family sees in this moment a chance, a chance that really is historic and may never come again, that the mightiest power in the world will give its full backing to an uprising and lead the Arabs against the Ottomans. In return, the British promised the Sharif and his son Faisal a kingdom which will extend across huge swathes of the Middle East. Faisal dreams of having his own empire, with Damascus as the center of power. A historic model was the great era of Umayyad rule, that of the first Islamic empire, hence Damascus as capital, as that had also been the capital of that empire. 
The government in London assigns Faisal an officer to assist him, who will later become famous as Lawrence of Arabia. The plan is that together they will use attacks to occupy Ottoman troops and thus help the British to victory. But the Arabs are unaware of their allies' real intentions. They are merely pawns in the game of the great powers. Promises were made that the Allies never had any intention of keeping. This was an Allied war strategy. There was no intention, at least not in the short term, of creating an Arab state in the region. It was merely a matter of stirring up the Arab population of the Ottoman Empire against the government, against the Sultan. And the British plan works. More and more tribes join the Arab revolt. It's only a matter of a few thousand rebels, but there is enormous symbolic value. It was also designed to act as a kind of lighthouse for other minorities who were aggrieved or who were being oppressed, or for other parts of the population to rise up against the foreign rule. Together with British troops, the rebels destroy important Ottoman supply routes. But the Arab revolt is only one part of a bigger plan to bring the Sultan to his knees. The idea was to attack the Ottomans from three sides, on one side with Indian troops from Iraq, on another from the Suez Canal with Faisal's troops and his Arab guerrillas, and the third was an attack on Constantinople. And the thinking was that if these attacks could be achieved at the same time, then the Ottoman Empire would be finished. But the attack in the north on Constantinople ends in disaster. When Allied troops land at Gallipoli on the Dardanelles, they are surprisingly beaten back by Ottoman forces. The offensive fails. Faisal and his revolt, meanwhile, are making impressive progress, which no one could have foreseen. In the end, the plan which has been given the least chance of success works from the start. This is a situation that the British haven't imagined, that maybe even Faisal and his family haven't imagined, that that part of the plan has succeeded to such an extent that they now suddenly have to keep their promise. Faisal's success puts the British in a dilemma. As they had long agreed with the French, to rule the region politically and exploit it economically. Even back then, it was all about oil. But these imperialistic thoughts presupposed a victory. And that is a long way away in 1916. On the Western Front, German troops are wearing out the Allies in devastating trench warfare. The war was going very badly for the Allies. I mean, the, they had tried their great breakthrough at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, and it hadn't gone well. And there was a view that they had to win over neutral opinion, particularly in the United States. But on the other side of the Atlantic, there is little enthusiasm for sending troops to faraway Europe. US President Wilson hesitates, as he has no domestic support for such a plan. The Allies then try and get one particularly influential part of American society on their side, the American Jews. With their support, US government opinion could be swayed. This is at least the thinking of the British Premier Lloyd George and the Foreign Minister Balfour. I think Balfour and Lloyd George had an exaggerated view of how powerful Jews were. It, they, they had this belief that you know, Jews were enormously powerful, they were all those Jewish bankers and financiers. In a way, I've always thought it's a form of anti-Semitism. It's, it's making assumptions about Jewish power, which go way back into European history. And I think they felt that if the Jews in the United States, for example, where the British were borrowing a lot of money, if the Jews thought that Britain was on their side, that would help in the war effort. 
Balfour publishes a declaration of intent to the Zionist movement. It stands in direct contradiction to the promise made to Faisal and the Arabs, with far-reaching consequences. It goes down in history as the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration gave British support for the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which was part of the Ottoman Empire. It didn't say a country, but I think a lot of people knew that that was probably what was implied in the long run. British and French politicians made all sorts of promises to all sorts of ethnic groups. These promises had the purpose of securing victory over the central powers. Thus, the interests of certain ethnic groups were subordinated to the general aim of winning the First World War. This, of course, can be described as cynical, which it doubtless was. Under the growing pressure of events in the war, in 1917, the USA comes in on the side of the Allies. After years of stalemate on the Western Front, the tide must now turn. Everything else is subordinated to this goal. The almost simultaneous promises made to both Arabs and Zionists could not have been realized in this form anyway. But that's not something that particularly concerns anyone at the moment. It's a problem that is put off and put off. The thinking is, once the war is won, there'll be a peace conference where we can then talk about the implementation of certain political goals. The USA's entry into the war helps the Allies on the Western Front make decisive progress. And in the Middle East, too, the Central Powers are now with their backs to the war. Faisal and his rebels advance as far as Damascus. They have kept their side of the bargain. The Ottoman Empire capitulates in October 1918. Allied warships arrive in Constantinople. The government there is toppled. The over 600-year-old Ottoman dynasty seems to be history. It was clear by the, by the end of the First World War that the Ottoman Empire was, was finished. It was falling to pieces. The Arabs had revolted in the course of the, of the First World War, and, and the government in, in Istanbul wasn't able really to hang on any longer. What had been held together for centuries now falls apart. Very different ethnic groupings of the doomed empire now start hoping for independence. Among them, those Armenians who survived the terrible genocide from 1915 onwards at the hands of the Ottomans, the Kurds and the Arabs, who now expect the promises made to them to be upheld. For many groups in the Middle East, this was an historic opportunity to realize their own projects, to bring their own identity into focus, found their own states and achieve autonomy. But the moment the idea of nation-states became en vogue and expectations were aroused, the problems began. These hopes were given particular sustenance by US President Wilson. In point 12 of his famous 14 points about the goals of the peace, he wanted to create a comprehensive new order for the entire Middle East. The peoples of the Ottoman Empire were intended to decide their own destiny. And this is precisely what Faisal is counting on. There's what you might call a certain revolution of expectation in all the countries that participated in the war. This means high demands are made and expectations aroused as far as the peace treaty is concerned. In Paris in 1919, troops of the Arab Revolt take part in the parade through the Arc de Triomphe. Faisal himself appears with his own delegation and tries to turn his military success into political facts through diplomatic means. Faisal comes into contact with international politics and with the help of his advisers quickly grasps how everything works. There are negotiations with the Zionist movement. He sits down with the French. He participates in an international conference. There's the famous photo of Faisal in Versailles. But Faisal now knows that his interests contradict those of his allies. The British and French aren't interested in an independent Arab kingdom. 
The hopes of promises made now coming true rest with President Wilson. But he turns out to be a very different political leader than hoped. What Wilson actually wants is misunderstood all over the world. When he talks of people's right to self-determination for nations, he's speaking relatively explicitly of white Europeans. Wilson is today an extremely controversial figure, as he was the president who introduced racial segregation in the federal institutions of the United States. He is, as it were, a 19th century liberal who, in today's terms, would be seen as a racist. In Paris, Faisal is confronted with the imperial mentality of his former allies. This is characterized by their tradition of subjugating colonial peoples. Both the British and the French felt that the people of the Middle East had been under the Ottomans, they weren't ready to be independent. I mean, there was a sort of, uh, really, I think, a, a racist imperialist attitude that these people were simply inferior and they, they couldn't probably rule themselves and they shouldn't rule themselves because they would make a mess of it. If we look at the news reporting of the time, we see that when one talked about Arabs, one imagined jihad, Bedouins on horseback, armed with swords, attacking an Ottoman artillery unit, shouting Allahu Akbar. One wasn't thinking of the advanced culture that existed in Arab cities, which were in part already sophisticated by Western standards. And the idea that the Orient is somehow different to us stuck. The Orient isn't rational. The Orient is a tribal society, and when it comes down to it, the people there need to be ruled by someone. They're not capable of organizing themselves politically. Faisal has almost no political capital. He is at the mercy of the victor's whims. Damascus is claimed by the French. What remains is a trade-off that has nothing to do with an independent Arab empire. Faisal's wishes regarding his kingdom in Damascus came to nothing because the French had been promised mandate rule over Syria. So the British sent him to Iraq and made him a puppet king. There, deeply disappointed, Faisal rules until his death in 1933, before his family's dynasty comes to an abrupt end in a putsch 20 years later. After the removal of Faisal, the Paris Conference runs according to the wishes of the powerful victors. They have a free hand to divide up the Middle East, just as they had planned from the start and practiced in the past. Well, they'd done it throughout the 19th century. I mean, the Europeans took over what they saw as open bits of the world. And that's very much the attitude, I think, with which they approached the Middle East, that here was territory which needed to be claimed. It was up for grabs. They should grab it. Already during the war, the French diplomat Francois Picot and his British counterpart Mark Sykes agreed on how the Middle East should look according to their idea. Using a ruler, the various different claims are ruthlessly staked. This secret agreement is called Sykes-Picot. Great Britain's economic interests lie in the region around Mosul. They know of the oil deposits there, and they want to secure them. Then there's the protection of the Suez Canal. France, on the other hand, has a historic interest in Syria, because France has traditionally seen itself as the supporting power of the Syrian Christians. Sykes-Picot went through various changes and iterations. It was an understanding. The real carve-up of the Middle East was done when the British and the French sat down and drew the lines on the map. In the porcelain factory in Sèvres, the seal is put on agreements that from now on will cause insoluble problems in the Middle East. The resolutions are anything but a finely balanced political strategy, but represent instead the rigorous pursuit of imperial interests at the expense of the regional population. France receives a mandate to rule over Syria and the Lebanon. 
Great Britain helps itself to Iraq and Palestine. The Arab Sharif of Mecca can only keep what he already owned anyway. And they did this without any consideration of the peoples living there. The French took a big chunk of Syria and put it into Lebanon for their own purposes, which has, of course, caused trouble ever since. And the British created Transjordan, as Jordan used to be called. And, of course, they allowed the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which was also going to cause intense conflict and problems, of course, throughout the 20th century. Basically, they didn't waste very much time thinking about the long-term after-effects. The first priority was creating new administrative units that were then divided up amongst themselves in the form of mandates from the League of Nations. The thinking was to create certain economic dependencies before these newly formed states could be granted their independence. But it still had consequences, because at the time, backroom talks were deciding how the spheres of influence and the regions of the Middle East could be divided up among Western European states. Nonetheless, the Middle East has been politically more highly charged in recent years than we've seen for decades. The demons of Sèvres keep returning to the theatres of war in the Middle East. In 2014, the terror organization Islamic State overruns large parts of Iraq. Then, in June, in the city of Mosul, the IS leader al-Baghdadi proclaims a new caliphate. The abolition of the caliphate after the end of the First World War is something that is seen by many Muslims in the larger context of the breaking up of the Ottoman Empire. Islamic State promised to reverse this situation. This is another reason for their popularity in certain quarters. Thus, the IS propaganda uses the humiliation of old for its own claims to power. At the height of their success, in an act of powerful symbolism, the Islamic State crossed the Iraqi-Syrian border. sykes picot The agreement of the diplomats is by no means forgotten in the Arab world. Every child in the Arab world knows sykes picot it's a symbol and is seen in the Middle East as the epitome of the West's deviousness, cunning and disingenuousness. As you can see, this is the so-called border of sykes pico Alhamdulillah, we don't recognize it and we will never recognize it. And as you can see here, it's a sign. To the Islamic State, the borders of the Middle East are a symbol of ruthless Western interest-driven politics. Inshallah, we'll break the barrier of Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, all the countries, inshallah, until we reach Quds, inshallah ta'ala. It's the first barrier of many barriers we'll break, inshallah ta'ala. To this day, it's a popular device in the Arab world to blame all transgressions, all negative developments, all self-inflicted developments on sykes pico It's all down to sykes pico It all began with what the British and the French did back then. And at the end of the day, they opened the gates of hell and haven't been able to close them again. My own feeling is that they need also to look at some of the other reasons. I mean, they have had in many countries bad leadership, corrupt leadership, um, leadership by very few people. They've had the military interfering in politics. And I think just focusing on Sykes-Picot is perhaps distracting attention, much needed attention from some of the other causes of instability and unfairness and injustice in the Middle East. Also in Turkey, the successor state to the Ottoman Empire, the Sevres Agreement has remained a powerful memory. Let us be honest. Turkey faces its biggest struggle since the war for independence. This struggle is a struggle of a single nation, a single flag, a single homeland, a single state. Dear brothers and sisters, if we quit in this critical phase of the rebuilding of the world and our region, we will return to the conditions we had at Sèvres.
sevr şartlarını What Sykes-Picot is for the Arabs, Sevra is for the Turks. Proof that the European powers want to hurt them and pursue interest-driven politics with no consideration for others. The agreement of Sevres, 1920. It would not only change the Middle East substantially, the Allies resolved to break up the Ottoman Empire of which the Turkish homeland is a part. In the eyes of the British Premier, the once mighty Caliphate has no future and should be wiped off the map of the world forever. The British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was an old-fashioned liberal, and the view of the liberals in the 19th century was that the Ottoman Empire was a despicable and backward organization. There are statements from the British Prime Minister saying that this agreement will satisfy Turkey's worst enemies. If one were to put together a list of the worst anti-Turkish statements, then David Lloyd George would probably be in first place. And David Lloyd George follows up his words with actions. At Sevres, the Allies forced the Turkish government to accept an agreement more drastic than the one forced on the Germans at Versailles. On the 10th of August, the delegation from the metropolis of Constantinople arrives in the Paris suburb and is called into the porcelain factory's magnificent hall. The political breakup is sealed. Basically, the Ottoman state loses its sovereignty over parts of Anatolia, which is seen as part of the Turkish homeland. While Armenia is awarded territory in the northeast, southern and southeastern Turkey are divided up into British, French and Italian zones of influence. In the west, Turkey has to cede territory to Greece. In contrast to the Treaty of Versailles, in which the Allies wanted to make sure that Germany wouldn't be able to make a comeback quickly, but nevertheless recognize that a country is also a people with whom one will have to deal in the future, in Sevres, they really did try to choke the life out of the Ottoman Empire. The Greek government in Athens also has a desire for retribution. The country was ruled by the Ottomans in the 19th century. It didn't regain sovereignty until the end of the War of Independence in 1832. Ever since the 19th century, when Greece was freed from the Ottoman yoke, there's been a new age of Hellenism all over Europe. This means that Greece, as the cradle of Western civilization, the cradle of democracy, is seen very positively in large parts of Europe, and in particular in Great Britain. The Greek delegation in Paris is hoping for the rebirth of a great empire. Prime Minister Eleftherios Venizelos leading the way. Prime Minister Venizelos was enormously persuasive and had this vision of a greater Greece and believed that the Greeks had the right and the ability to spread out. And he dreamed also of, of pushing Greek influence into Istanbul and possibly into the Black Sea, where there had also been a Greek presence in the classical time. But th these were the ambitions of a nation builder. But for his vision, the Premier needs the support of powerful partners. And Lloyd George has, once again, a plan in mind which first and foremost serves British interests. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, sees Greece as the new strong partner in the Mediterranean. Because if the Ottoman Empire was going to fail, the British needed some sort of ally at the eastern end of the Mediterranean to protect Egypt and the route through to India. This was very important for the British. The Suez Canal, which goes through Egypt, was crucially important for the British. And so they thought, great, the Ottoman Empire is gone. We can't prop it up anymore. No point with that. We'll support a bigger Greece, which will be our ally at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. It was a disaster. This disaster takes place shortly after the First World War. In Smyrna, today Izmir, 
Venezuela sends in an invasion force with the express support of the British. The city in those days is characterized by a multitude of ethnicities and religions, mostly living together in peace. Smyrna was a commercial city which was completely multi-ethnic. It was a city with an enormous number of Greeks and Armenians, in other words, a large number of Christians. From the base in Smyrna, Greece increasingly tries to expand its sphere of influence. The Turkish government in Constantinople has been weakened and has no means of resisting its neighbors' invasory ambitions. The Greek troops quickly advance into the hinterland. Here they meet the first Turkish resistance, made up of former soldiers of the Ottoman Empire. Their leader, Mustafa Kemal, later known as Atatürk the father of modern Turkey. He unifies the scattered units and tries everything to stop the Greek advance. The Greeks faced the opposition of the Turkish resistance, whose strategy was basically to lure the Greeks ever further inland, where the weather conditions were very demanding. It was extremely hot during the day and extremely cold at night. That meant that when large numbers of troops had to be moved or supplies brought to the front, relatively small groups of Turkish guerrillas could carry out effective attacks. In a merciless guerrilla war, Mustafa Kemal quickly gains decisive advantages. Places taken by the Greeks are retaken. Mutual hatred erupts. Massacres of the civilian population are soon part of the tragic reality in this bloody war. The fighting escalates relatively quickly with attacks on the civilian population, both on the Muslims by the invading Greeks, but also on the Christian minorities by the Turks. The situation continues to deteriorate in a classical escalation scenario. Here it's inhabitants against inhabitants and not about power struggles. This is happening amongst the population which is actively involved. The inhabitants are automatically part of the warring factions due to their ethnicity and religion. There are no civilians, and where there are no civilians, no prisoners are taken. It's not a question of forcing the other side to accept one's will, but of liquidating and delegitimizing them. The Greek troops are soon pushed back to the coast. The army flees, leaving behind a defenseless population. In September 1922, the Turks reached the port of Smyrna, from where the Greek invasion began. Ataturk came with his troops to the outskirts of the city, and the Greeks, knowing what was going to happen, knowing they were probably going to be slaughtered, and the slaughter was already starting, began to flee towards the water. In this situation, the civilian population is completely at the mercy of the enemy, who has been politically radicalized by three years of conflict. There had already been attacks on the Muslim population in Smyrna in 1919. Now the hour of retribution has arrived. The British observe the drama in Smyrna from a distance. And there are these dreadful scenes of people jumping into the water, trying to save their children. But we don't know how many people died. I think it's 20 or 30,000 at least. And Ataturk did nothing to stop his troops. I think the anger among Turks against the Greeks now was so great that they were not prepared to do anything. The once so flourishing port is the scene of the bloodiest event of the war. The fires in the Greek and Armenian quarters burn for days, leaving only ruins.
noch heute ist diese Episode in Griechenland bekannt. In Greece, this catastrophe is still notorious today. Es gibt hier nur Schätzungen. In all, these are only estimates. Between 1919 and 1922, up to 250,000 people lose their lives in a conflict often forgotten in the West. 1922. This terrible episode is remembered very differently in Turkey. It is the birth of an independent, confident and modern Turkish society. They have successfully resisted the imposition of Sèvres. To this day, the period casts a shadow over relations with their Greek neighbors. With his war of liberation, Mustafa Kemal creates military facts on the ground and forces the victors of the First World War to return to the negotiating table. In Lausanne in 1923, he now forces the Allies to accept his position. Es gibt ja mit dem Friedensvertrag von Lausanne 1923 einen zweiten Friedensvertrag. A second peace treaty is drawn up in Lausanne, which basically makes the fledgling state of Turkey, the Turkish Republic, one of the victors of the First World War, where Kemal Atatürk manages not only to drive back invading Allied troops and defeat them, but also to consolidate the integrity of the Turkish state in Anatolia. Status in Anatolien zu konsolidieren. The agreement of Sèvres is annulled. Atatürk forms the Turkey we know today. And the borders are not the only thing he establishes. He also wants a homogenous Turkish society. There is still a large Greek minority in Anatolia and many Turkish inhabitants in Greece. The Lausanne Agreement determines that Greek Orthodox Christians and Muslims will simply be exchanged. It is assumed that after the extremely bloody Greek-Turkish conflict, stability and peace in the region can only be preserved if the different religious communities are disentangled. At the beginning of the 1920s, an exchange of inhabitants is seen as a completely logical means of settling conflicts. We just have to split up the people and resettle them, and then peace will reign. This has had catastrophic consequences for the region. More than a million Greeks lose their homes. Athens faces an unprecedented wave of refugees. The consequences are homelessness and starvation. In a new home, they've never known. This can only be seen as an extraordinary uprooting for all concerned. And even if you had been a Greek in Smyrna, and of course spoke Greek, and would probably have been a Christian, your roots, your home, your way of life, your family came from Smyrna, and suddenly you find yourself in a suburb of Athens. And you're somewhere where you don't know anyone, in a place you've never seen before, even if it is your country because you speak the language. But is it really your culture? The Armenians, on the other hand, lose their sovereignty after only two years to Soviet Russia. Turkey, too, changes perceptibly during this period. While, a few years before, different ethnic groups lived here together, Atatürk's state is now an assimilated Turkish-Muslim society. Diversity was an important part of the Ottoman order, both in the state and in the cityscape. And this gets destroyed in this period. This changed Turkey more dramatically than many events of the First World War. People are no longer Turks because they are inhabitants of Anatolia or a subject of the Ottoman Empire. Now people are Turks if they have Turkish blood and are members of the Sunni Islamic faith. Everyone else is a guest. Although the Sevres Agreement was revoked, it still has enormous significance in Turkey and casts a long shadow today. This can be seen after the failed putsch of the 15th of July 2016, when members of the armed forces attempted to overthrow the government. The fear of political influence from outside, along with enemies on the inside, 
is often justified with the old Paris Agreement. In Turkey, it is known as Sevres Syndrome. The 15th of July is the second war of liberation for the Turkish nation, and we should recognize it as such. If this putsch had been successful, we would have been forced to accept something that would have made us long for the Sevres Agreement. In the Sevres Agreement, you can find everything that can be construed in Turkey as a conspiracy against them. And the Sevres Agreement has established itself in the press, in popular culture, in films, and especially, of course, in the propaganda speeches of different heads of state, and in particular, Erdogan. The Sevres Peace Treaty does allow for different nationalities. It includes a Kurdish state or statehood, which is not clearly stated. It could be an autonomous area or a state. But Atatürk's triumph seals the fate of an independent Kurdish state. In the Lausanne Agreement, there is no mention of possible independence for this ethnic group. The Lausanne Peace Agreement transformed Turkey from a vanquished state to a victor of the First World War and thus buried any hope of independent statehood. The rejection of any right to autonomy, and in particular demands for independent statehood, are basically conflicts that from this moment onwards, from the First World War onwards, and from the agreements made in Paris, still reverberate today. Today, between 20 and 30 million Kurds live on the borders of various states. It is thus the largest ethnic group in the world without its own state. The Kurds are one of these very unfortunate people who live in a world that is difficult and have a great many enemies. And none of the governments in those countries really want an independent Kurdistan. But the rise of the Islamic State in 2014 creates new political facts. Civil war torn Syria and the weakened government in Baghdad are not capable of stopping the extremists' triumphant progress. The international community seeks new allies in the fight against the IS and finds them, above all, in the form of the Kurds. The Americana. The Americans and other powers in the region aroused expectations in the Kurds by saying to them, you're really the only good allies we have against the Islamic State and against the terror. Weapons were supplied, advisors dispatched, and a certain level of expectation was cultivated. The Kurdish fighters are one of the few warring parties in the region whose ground troops can effectively push back the Islamic State. They liberate and occupy areas in northern Syria. By now it's clear that they link their actions to the long-held hope of founding their own state as soon as they have driven the IS out of the region. We've taken their ammunition. We've killed a lot of them. In this attack, we were successful. We have taken this position back from them. Now we'll beat them everywhere. And we'll advance meter for meter. We'll manage it for the benefit of everyone. We will liberate Kurdistan. For the first time in decades, there is something like a Kurdish state project in both Syria and Iraq, although in very different forms. What one can accuse the Americans and other powers, including the Russians, of is that they have used the Kurds as a playing card and made promises or aroused vague expectations as their allies against the Islamic State. In the end, this will cost human lives. Because Turkey hasn't the slightest intention of coming even close to fulfilling such hopes. When the USA withdraws its troops from northern Syria in 2019, they abandon their former allies. There is no longer any talk of moral responsibility in Washington. You don't have any regret 
for giving Erdogan the green light to, to invade? I didn't give him a green light. We paid a lot of money to the Kurds, tremendous amounts of money. We've given them massive fortunes. And you know what? It's wonderful. They fought with us, but we paid a lot for them to fight with us. We have a situation where Turkey is taking land from Syria. Syria is not happy about it. Let them work it out. Shortly after the American withdrawal, Turkish tanks crossed the border into Syria. Kurdish areas should now be transformed into Turkish security zones. The dream of Kurdistan has once again evaporated. Man hört you often hear comparisons and memories from Kurds of the time after the First World War. You often hear, we are basically the eternal losers of political power games and intrigues and rivalry in the Middle East. Power games that reached their peak in Paris after the First World War. The victors didn't create order and peace in the Middle East and Anatolia, but instead made false promises, disappointed allies, and sowed hatred. New borders were drawn, new states were created, which had enormous potential for conflict, and which, if you look from 1918 to the present, keep returning to the political agenda. The wounds of the past have not healed, but are in fact still open and bleeding. And no one knows how this conflict can ever be brought to an end. We only talk in terms of powder kegs and conflagration. All the expressions that we associate with the Middle East, the perception that this region will never have peace creates facts on the ground in the politics, in the powerful way people conduct politics in the region. And they don't look at the big picture. They don't start to think creatively. They only think of short-term interests. And it's my impression that this attitude, this view of the region, is a consequence of this period, of the Sevra Agreement, of the post-war order after the First World War. The bloody legacy of Sevres. The porcelain factory is a symbol of just how fragile the world in the Middle East remains today. <laughs>